Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Glenn Cerny. It's January. That means that the legislative session must be just about going. So it's time to once again renew our 12th season of your legislators here at KRWG. And it's almost become a post holiday tradition that uh, Senator John Arthur Smith from Deming joins us to take a look at what's ahead. And you don't have to worry about uh, making errors because I didn't say it was 2017, but I wasn't off by a year <laughs> that it is indeed the 12th year of your legislator. But thank you so much for joining us before the hectic season really gets going up in Santa Fe. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, going to be an uh, interesting session here starting in a, you, a you know, couple I, weeks. It, it's odd you should use that because I'm, I'm sitting and, and I'm preparing. I'm going, boy, this is going to be just an odd year. And then I started thinking, okay, in the 12 years we've been doing this show, has there not been an odd year? Uh, every year is an odd year. Some are more <laughs> odd than others. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull moment, I <laughs> that's think. That's right, is, that's right. Is, but but uh, to get things going, short session. Um, budget, 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 and, and budget is, is what's going to be discussed. And for a change, you aren't coming in here with this umbrella with the rain and the overcast sky. Doesn't mean it was bright and sunny, but there is some money in the coffers this time. Uh, there's some money in the coffers, and, and it's a good thing because uh, up until now we've robbed virtually every corner there is in the state where there's might be some money uh, to just keep moving ahead uh, on that and so we've got a lot of backfilling that we need to do right now the new dollars that we're forecasting is about 200 million dollars uh, that is attributed principally to uh, the improved outlook of, of oil and gas our productions up the price of oil is uh, stabilized and we like it stabilized right now uh, um, anytime it uh, decreases or increases rapidly, there's a whiplash either way. Uh, so stability is the buzzword as far as I'm concerned. You, you and I both rely on the same barometer when we take a look at the economic outlook uh, of uh, the situation, and that, that's uh, Professor Jim Peach here on campus. Is he pretty comfortable with the numbers that are being bandied around? You know, I haven't uh, spoken with Jim, and, and uh, I've extended uh, an offer through staff to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Peach come uh, present to the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, you know, Senate uh, uh, Professor Peach is a real jewel for New Mexico. Uh, he knows oil and gas better than most, and uh, it's uh, he, he lays it on the line. He doesn't try and dance around it. He'll tell you exactly what he thinks. Uh, I go back about four years ago when I asked for. Uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Peach and Dr. Mitchell at UNM uh, on that and and Dr. Peach uh, I asked for it I didn't ask through it the, through it the Legislative Finance Committee um, but I just wanted a different set of eyes on what the outlook might be uh, Dr. Peach came and uh, and presented to our committee uh, he uh, uh, had a disclaimer in his presentation that he wasn't representing uh, New Mexico State University, uh, but he laid it out for us. Uh, and as it turned out, the administration was a little bit annoyed with what he had forecast. Uh, quite frankly, they should have listened to him because exactly what he told our finance committee uh, did uh, prevail and it, it unfolded that way. And as a result, uh, he established a whole bunch of credibility uh, with the legislature. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's pivotal. We've obviously had him on the air here many times talking about the local economy. Um, and, and again, it's something that I struggle to understand. And I'm, from what it uh, sounds like, you had the same issue. And when he came in, you kind of went, oh, okay, I may not right. understand it, but at least I have some idea. Well, that's, uh, that's true. And uh, my degree was in biology, but I'm a good listener when it comes to economics. 
All right, um, we're, we're talking about possibly having some uh, money to deal with th this year, but then all of a sudden uh, another uh, wild card gets tossed on, and that's federal tax legislation. And I, I can't imagine all the corners that may impact what's happening in New Mexico. Well, the uh, the component with the federal uh, tax bill that's uh, before the Congress uh, and and the president is uh, is a real challenge for the state because there's a component in it in that bill if in the event uh, that it increases the debt then sequestration sets in and it's projected to have a 1.5 uh, trillion dollar deficit in spending and if that comes to pass Congress will take up the sequestration issue uh, in another piece of legislation but New Mexico just off federal mineral leases alone uh, garnishes about 450 million a year that goes into our general fund. About 60 percent of that goes into public ed and higher ed. Uh, so that is a huge hit on a six billion dollar plus uh, general fund budget. That's about eight percent of it, and uh, they they're proposing uh, to uh, mitigate that deficit spending. That uh, they take. Uh, what New Mexico gets now is 48 percent of the federal mineral lease and they're wanting to wipe that out and said the, the federal government will take 100 percent of it uh, for 10 years. So that is a huge hit, a huge uh, unknown uh, as far as New Mexico is concerned. Wyoming's in the same boat. Uh, I suspect uh, some other extractive industry, uh, places are uh, in a similar situation. Texas not so much because it's not federal land in Texas. It's virtually deeded land. So uh, that's uh, an issue that uh, many of us on the budget side will lay awake and be a little bit concerned about. Uh, Eight percent cut is sounds like what the universities in higher education took in one year and we're going to have to be taking that every year for ten years. You know, and I was a little surprised when you and I were, were chatting before we went on. I, I, I was a little concerned about Medicaid, um, or Medicaid, and you, you said Medicare may be, and for those of us that do have gray hair, that, that's an issue. Well, the, uh, the, the concern with Medicaid is the, the block grant issue, and that being reduced uh, from whatever the base year is or, uh, established. And, uh, and, but that's probably going to, it won't happen this session. Uh, I, I think that's down the road on the Medicaid. On the Medicare, uh, that, that is uh, an area where it would be subjected to that sequestration issue that I just spoke about with the federal mineral lease. That number that was provided to me is around $160 million a year on the, on the Medicare uh, cuts, but that would be federal. That wouldn't be going to our general fund. Well, issue. the other area that, that, that we, we've always struggled on is, is child welfare and, and to transition from the federal tax reform to uh, the issues here in, in Santa Fe next month. But you look at children's uh, health insurance program, the CHIP program, and there, there's some of those childhood programs that are going to be looking uh, down the barrel of a gun as well. You know, we're told uh, that the, uh, the feds, the, uh, the U.S. Congress is going to renew that CHIP program. But we've been telling that, uh, been told that for several weeks now, and it still hasn't happened. Uh, that's about a $31 million hit for the state to pick up that difference, and uh, I believe the state's going to have to pick that up if the feds uh, do cut it off, and, and that's a, a challenge toward the $200 million that we uh, uh, potentially may have in new money. You know, I apologize. We started on kind of an up note talking about there actually being some money in, and then we've immediately brought it into, hmm, what are we going to do about this? So let, let's start to look at, at what may happen, and, and we're talking about federal tax reform, but there's also been some push on the state level for tax reform. Uh, any idea on where, where that stands coming into a, a very short session? Well, uh, you will find that at the national level and at the uh, state level, uh, tax reform is always a buzzword and it's uh, amplified even more during an election year. Uh, so that's what's happening in the state of New Mexico. Uh, the difference between the federal and the state is New Mexico has to have a balanced budget. That means that uh, we can't spend more money than what we have coming in and so as a result any relief one might give you have to have an offset or a additional uh, reduction in spending. Uh, on, on that. So we don't have the flexibility of running the deficit uh, and I'm not advocating that at the federal level but uh, a, 
to have tax reform in this state. Uh, and I've monitored taxes closely over the years. I used to uh, be in the legislature when I thought we could do it in one year uh, overnight. And then I've uh, become a disciple of the belief that, that you have to do it, tweak it on an annualized basis and unfold that tax reform o over a five year period, let's say for example. But you cannot have true tax reform in the state of New Mexico if you go around as a politician talking about we're going to lower your rates. The only way on gross receipts you're going to lower the rates is you've got to bring food and medical back into the, into the uh, formula uh, on that. And it's my take that you're going to hear a lot of noise about tax reform uh, here in the state of New Mexico. But when push comes to shove and all House members are up for re-election, uh, I strongly suspect that you're going to hear more rhetoric than action. You, you, you brought up the election in November and, and the House and, and a gubernatorial race. So does it change the complexion of this session knowing that there's going to be, I mean, would it be wrong to say substantial change in the makeup of the House, Senate, and, and governor? You know, I don't know whether it's going to be change or not, but typically an executive uh, has to do the leading. Uh, when you want uh, change, it's very difficult for any governor to lead in the last year of their last term uh, on that. And if you have polling that is in the 30 percent range, it's tough to be convincing that you need to go out and make these changes for New Mexico. Uh, so election is, is huge. Uh, the election process is huge. I don't see huge numbers changing in the state. But I don't know what whiplash New Mexico is going to get because of what's going on at the federal level. Uh, there, there was a message in the Virgi Virginia Assembly. Uh, when you have that many seats change, I wasn't looking at the gubernatorial race. But I think the Assembly tells a huge, huge story. Uh, and if that tsunami hits, you could see uh, significant numbers changing here in the state. Well, and, and I just just look at the number of, of incumbents that aren't running for because they're running for another office or, or running. You know, there's going to be some changeover. Now, whether it's political party change is, is different, but there will be uh, new people coming into uh, the House uh, for sure in 2019. Well, there will be new people coming in, and on the Senate side, I have two colleagues that sit on Senate Finance uh, with me, and they're both running for offices. I've got uh, Senator Howie Morales running for Lieutenant Governor. And I've got uh, Senator George Munoz running for land commissioner. And if they're successful in their efforts, there's going to be a huge change in Senate Finance Committee. And, and you can add another one, and Senator uh, Cervantes here from Las Cruces, who's also throwing his hat in. Y yes, and, and uh, Cervantes is, is not on the uh, uh, Finance Committee, but it would be a, a huge change for us because he's, uh, he adds a lot. Uh, you know, he's on the Judiciary Committee. And as a practicing attorney, he brings some insight that is something other than theory, but is actual practice, and we appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've got a little pot of money here. Let's start talking about how do you look at this, how do you parse it, what's going on. And I'm going to ask you one question, uh, but I need to uh, admit that, that I am paid partially by state funding. So when I ask this question, I want to, uh, yes, I am interested. But uh, state pay, it's been, what, four or five years since state employees has received any kind of uh, increase? Is there any uh, thought on where that might go? It's uh, a, about six years for the most part. And uh, we, we adopted a legislative finance committee, uh, House Bill 2, and in that we have small compensation package. Uh, not just because it's long overdue, but let me give you some examples of some difficulties we're having in the state. Uh, number one, on the judicial branch, we the, have the lowest paid compensated judiciary in the country uh, on that. And trying to get somebody that's a seasoned attorney to run for uh, a judgeship is a challenge. So you're getting a lot of very young, inexperienced people that someday may turn out to be great judges, but there's a learning curve there. And you would like to at least have a balance of some seasoned people on that. And the compensation package we have right now doesn't do that. Even here in, in Doniana County, uh, uh, former Senator Macias, District Judge Macias, has left the, uh, the, the bench, or will be leaving the bench here shortly. And his compensation is better in county government than what it was as a district judge. 
but there's other issues on the judicial side. Uh, we've had high, high vacancy rates on the clerk side. We're talking in the 20, 25% range and it takes a, uh, quite a while to train those people and what we find now is that they're moving into the private sector on that and it's very difficult to recruit and you have a lot of money in trying to train those that have left. On the, let's say the Department of Corrections, we've got a 30% vacancy rate. The vacancy rate is uh, sort of a two-edged sword there because your correction officers are working 70 hours a week to make a living. But 70 hours a week does not provide you with any family time either. And so as a result, if you, uh, if you brought that back into balance, you're gonna have to compensate them more because they're gonna be getting fewer hours, but you have to make it attractive enough to add additional personnel to corrections. And a lot of people aren't interested in corrections, but we just could be inviting uh, problems that we had back in the early 80s, late 70s uh, on that, but that has to be addressed. Well, and compounding the problem is as uh, health rates have gone up and contributions to pensions have gone up, it just hasn't, hasn't been there. So it's not something like you've got a magic wand and say, okay, let's do this and, and make it happen. Well, uh, no, and, and whatever we do, we, if, if we're successful in getting the governor on board with the additional compensation package uh, on that, it's going to be a... a uh, uh, you, you can't do it overnight, but you're going to have to do it in two or three steps over t uh, three or four years uh, on, on that. And, and so that's uh, an issue you have to look into the out years to see what our revenues might be to see if you can sustain that. But we've got that in, in public education. We've got it here in higher education right here on the, the campus. Uh, they've uh, reduced personnel by about 750 people here at New Mexico State University. Uh, that's a huge economic hit locally uh, that nobody pays attention to. We have not had, have, do not have the jobs now that we had in 2005. The administration goes around and they talk about job gains. They're talking about this time this year versus last year. But we have fewer people employed now than what we had in 2005. You, you, you talked about uh, law enforcement and the, the penal system and whatnot. You know, one area where I, where I think it all comes together and most people agree with, and I'm, I, I know Senator Papen here in Las Cruces would, is, is the mental health issues. That a lot of what's happening with the jails and the prisons is also a mental health issue. It, it, what's the feeling for somehow strengthening or trying to better the position of mental health facilities in the state? Well, we, we have a, uh, a, a fresh sit, uh, situation with the behavioral health issue. Uh, that just happened uh, tragically up in Aztec, New Mexico. Uh, so it brings it home to most people. You have young students on campus here that probably graduated from that high school and uh, Cruces is impacted when something like that comes out. On the behavioral health side, uh, that is a shame. Uh, 15 providers were exonerated. But in the meantime, 1,600 jobs were lost when the administration did what they did. Uh, on that. The administration does not talk about that. They talk about more people they're servicing. If you talk to law enforcement, if you talk to the judicial branch, uh, many of the incarcerated people are in dire need of mental health, behavioral health, more than, than uh, make, making certain that they're locked up forever uh, on that. And you know, Utah went through uh, prison reform. Utah is a pretty conservative state and it's probably the best managed state in the entire West uh, on that. And they started talking about uh, prison reform uh, five years ago and starting to institute that and I think you'll see some positive results uh, on, on that. But a large component of that is mental health and behavioral health and obviously we need to pay more attention to that. One of the uh, front and center uh, issues in uh, the national level and the state level is, is uh, um, harassment. And, and, and I, I applaud what, what I think you're trying to do with the legislation, but it also seems a little out of the norm to be voting on something the day before the session starts on, on how to reform training and, and get some of that sexual harassment uh, training in, in the state house. Well, on the uh, 15th of uh, December, 
we had a legislative council hearing and a presentation made and you had many of the advocates uh, there that were uh, giving uh, uh, their testimony, uh, speaking to the leadership in the Senate uh, and the House for that matter, but they put together a working group in a bipartisan fashion to assimilate, look at what we have on the books versus uh, what we might need to have. You're into equal opportunity issues, federal law. Uh, the legislature is not an employee of the state. Uh, we're per diem on that and so it's a little different creature uh, from that standpoint. Uh, so I'm hoping that with that working group that they will have a positive recommendation uh, by the uh, here in a couple weeks uh, on that but in the event they don't uh, uh, don't blame them I mean uh, it's uh, moving faster uh, not quite as fast as the tax bill in Washington on that uh, because we've all had a chance or will have had a chance to at least uh, get that input and hear what their work recommendations are. You know, but the other part here that, that kind of comes in, at least in my mind, and, and has there been work in, in that, the harassment side? I mean, every year we talk about ethics investigations. We talk about we've had a lieutenant governor that's had to resign. You've got a leader in the Senate who's uh, been caught up and pulled out of statewide races. Is, is, can you tie that into ethics reform in the House and Senate? You know, I can, you, you can tie it in, but you, you've got to remember that, uh, that those issues were taken care of within the Senate, the existing mechanism. Uh, we had a senator that just went to trial and he's uh, waiting for sentencing, uh, but he resigned from the, sen uh, the Senate. Uh, there's reasons they resigned. Uh, on that because they had a, uh, a chat with uh, the New Mexico State Senate in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and obviously we've got the, some other issues that are flying right now uh, on the uh, Lieutenant Governor's race uh, that you allude to. Uh, he extracted himself from that. He was uh, a, uh, in, in the uh, leadership position and, and he was uh, removed from, from that. Uh, and I might add he was a very hard-working senator, worked around the clock uh, on that and had some wonderful initiatives. Uh, he'll be allowed to pursue those as a sitting regular senator but not as a chair of uh, uh, or as, uh, uh, as a, a leader in the, on the uh, Democrat caucus. You, you, you mentioned um, the, 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 he's a hard-working so I, I can't imagine what those discussions are like inside the chambers because Despite what we hear about the acrimony and everything, you, you, you do get to know your colleagues in the Senate very, very well. You know, uh, that's the sad portion, and that's when everybody sits back and, well, it's got to be a fun job. It's not a fun job. Uh, I, I guess one of the saddest situations we had is we had a Secretary of State that had to resign that sat in the Senate, yeah. and quite frankly, every senator, Republican and Democrat, uh, when she was serving in the Senate, liked her on that and uh, she was uh, re removed uh, or resigned and on, on that and stepped aside and uh, had to go to trial. I bring up this next question with, with a, a lot of trepidation. I, I've already mentioned we both have gray hair, um, but, but a, a 2015 survey found that the New Mexico legislators uh, had the highest average age of any in the country. And, and, and I've got to imagine that some of that would be because of the non-paying situation. Um, and, and so we've talked about, you know, will this change? Do you see any movement, any reason to be looking at this? Because it also goes down, you talked about, to the not having a full-time staff. So when you're chasing around the state during the non-session, and by the way, I need to point out, the amount of travel that your legislators do in, in the non-legislative, in fact, I've got to believe to some degree you're happy when the session's in because you know where you're going to be sleeping <laughs> most of the time. Um, but, but is there any discussion, any concern that you have? in that regard? You know, we have concern uh, in, in that area. The complexity of the issues today when you start talking Medicaid issues, uh, when you talk about education uh, requirements, uh, it's pretty challenging and you have to have a pretty knowledgeable legislative member uh, there. Anyone that tells you it's part-time 
Uh, I'm a, I, I speak uh, to the fact that it's not. Now, when they tell you it's part-time, they're recruiting you to run for office. Uh, that happened to me 30 years ago uh, on that. Uh, but it's an issue that is going to be in the hands of the public. It'll have to be a constitutional amendment. Uh, I would not be a beneficiary of that. Uh, you know, I don't plan on running more than three or four more times, and there are only four-year terms on that and if I'm successful uh, uh, but I don't think it's going to happen quickly but it's a discussion that needs to take place in this state when you start looking at uh, the conflicts of interest legislative attorneys uh, members that are attorneys having state contracts uh, there are some issues there uh, from that in my own appraisal practice I've tried to avoid every vote on every appraisal bill that has ever become before us in the last 30 years uh, on that and uh, I'm one of those that have taken a walk on that one uh, from that because I perceive that as a conflict of interest. In my own work I no longer do condemnation work for universities because some of those dollars might be used that we appropriate for acquisition of property. Uh, so it hits you in the pocketbook from that standpoint but not just from my take when you have what few young people we have in the legislature it's tough for them to run their business, uh, support their family, and still give uh, appropriate time to their legislative job. It takes somebody that uh, is sort of gray-headed with an income level, and but for my family, but for my family, I would not be able to serve. Uh, my wife is a retired educator. Uh, my sons were out of college. I, the, I ran when he was in his last semester, the youngest one, knowing full well that there was an uh, very expensive uh, price tag to serving in the New Mexico legislature. Yeah. Well, we started things off uh, today by saying it was going to be a uh, action-packed and just kind of a strange session, and we've certainly <laughs> laid out some of the reasons why. Uh, again, I really want to uh, thank you. I, I mean, coming out of the holiday season and your busy schedule, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the number of years you and I have sat at this table now talking about what's coming up, and uh, we'll be watching, and as you know, let us know if there's anything we can do to help get the word out of what's happening in Santa Fe as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. It is indeed the 12th year of your legislators. We certainly hope you'll join us each and every week here on KRWG as we try to keep you abreast on the fast happenings that are going on at the State House. I'm Glenn Cerny. Have a wonderful weekend.